ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار In today's lesson we look at the commentary of Sheikh Muhammad Aman Al-Jami rahimahullahu ta'ala upon the second principle and so Sheikh Al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab rahimahullahu ta'ala said al-qa'idatu thaniyah the second principle annahum yaqulun that they say ma da'awnahum wa tawajjahna ilayhim illa li talab al-qurba wa shafa'a so these people who we've already established that they believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who creates is the one who provides is the one who owns everything and is the one who regulates and controls everything they already affirm this and so here they say that we only called upon them meaning the deities we only invoked them and directed ourselves towards them turned towards them for no other reason except to ask neeness with Allah and intercession with Allah so the sheikh says rahimahullah ta'ala that the very first pagans the very first mushriks whom the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam fought against they would openly announce that they do not believe that those whom they call upon have control over benefit or harm the only thing they desired was simply to become closer to Allah nothing else and that they intercede for them with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they believed in Allah the creator of the heavens and earth but they also believed in deities upon this earth in smaller deities of a lesser status upon this earth and the benefit of these deities on this earth was that they can be invoked they can be called upon and that these deities will then in turn invoke Allah call upon Allah make dua to Allah and intercede and bring those people nearer to Allah this is what they used to say the pagans the mushrikeen in the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this is established in the quran sheikh al-islam muhammad bin abdul wahhab then went on to give evidences for each of these two things and as for the evidence of al-qurba al-qurba we mentioned this is in surah zumar surah 39 verse 3 ma na'buduhum illa liyuqarribuna ila allah zulfa what did they say we do not worship them ma na'buduhum illa liyuqarribuna ila allah zulfa before this allah said wal ladhina attakhadhu min dunihi awliya those who take besides him friends and protectors as protectors awliya they say we do not worship them except that they may bring us closer to allah notice the sheikh says that these people when they said that we do not worship them except that they may bring us closer to allah they treated them as awliya as awliya meaning that these awliya they have something of walaya meaning that they have something of love and veneration and after this after referring to them as awliya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentioned the reason of the mushrikeen which is that they want to become closer but to use the word ma na'buduhum ma na'buduhum this is a citation a quotation of what the pagans used to say in the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
which means that they used to acknowledge that what they are doing is ibadah. They clearly acknowledge that we are indeed worshipping those whom we consider to be awliya and we are seeking through them nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very different to the ignoramuses who are present today, the juhal, and they do not label what they do as ibadah. They do not admit and acknowledge that what they are doing is indeed worship. It enters into worship. Rather, if you were to say to them that what you are doing is ibadah, from their ignorance they would become very angry. So when you say to someone who is making tawaf, he's walking around the tomb or the grave, or the one who sacrifices an animal, a goat, a ram, a lamb, the one who sacrifices anything and dedicates it to this dead sheikh or this dead wali, this is ibadah. If you were to say to him, do not worship this wali, do not worship this sheikh, he will become he will, he will become angry. And he will say, how can you say that I am worshipping the sheikh? How can you say this? Am I worshipping other than Allah? How can you even say this? This is how he will respond. However, that which he does is indeed worship. It is worship, but what will he call it? He will call it mahabba. He will call it mahabba to us. And in the judgment of the Qur'an, it is ibadah. It is worship on many different counts. He sacrifices to other than Allah. He makes tu'af. He walks around the grave in veneration. Or he makes dua, he invokes. He calls upon the dead. Or he seeks rescue, he makes istighatha. He makes istigha, he seeks for rescue and help and aid from the dead. All of this is ibadah. Yet what does he say? He says this is mahabba. This is mahabba. Notice the play with words. Or notice the fact that words do not change the realities. But he sees it as mahabba. He sees it as love of the salihin. And he sees all of these actions which the sharia has judged to be shirk and kufr. He labels that as mahabba, as love. So the understandings have changed. And ibadah has been labeled with something else. So instead of it being ibadah now, it is, it is mahabbah. Either, either it is due to ignorance, either this is from ignorance, or it is out of the pretense of ignorance. And obviously, the common people, the, the, the general people, they are misled and deceived by their leaders because it is their leaders who tell them that this is from the love of the righteous. Do not abandon the righteous. Do not disrespect the righteous. Do not revile their position and their status. But rather respect them and honor them. And all of this is from loving them. To invoke them. To sacrifice to them. To visit their tombs. To make tabarruk from them. So the common people are misled and misguided by these evil scholars, these evil people who guide them away from Tawheed and from the truth and then they bring all of this flowery speech that this is not shirk this is not ibadah what you are doing this is mahabba, this is love of the righteous and this is how they misguide these people then in this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَحْكُمُ بَيْنَهُمْ فِي مَا هُمْ فِيهِ يَخْتَلِفُونَ Indeed, Allah will judge between them in that which they differ. So in this statement, which occurs right after the previous statement, after the excuse given by the mushrikeen that they seek nearness to Allah, Allah says, indeed, Allah will judge between them in that which they differ. This actually is a threat, a severe threat, as the Shaykh says. Because... The judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a just judgment. Whoever does evil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will seek revenge, and that is out of justice. Whoever is punished, he's always punished out of the justice 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Meaning he deserved to be punished And so when Allah punishes Then Allah has simply been just But as for the one who does good Then he is rewarded out of the favor and the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Not that he had a right upon Allah But rather it is purely from Allah's bounty And his favor and his mercy That he rewarded the one who did good Thus when he judges and punishes It is from his adl, from his justice And when he rewards It is from his fadl it is from his bounty and favor. Then after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, Inna Allah la yahdi man huwa kathibun kafar. Indeed, Allah does not guide the one who is a liar. Kathibun kafar. And the one who is a disbeliever. Referring to the mushrikun who are committing shirk in this way and who are telling lies, they are telling lies, just like these people tell lies today who say that this is mahabba, that we are loving the righteous, we are respecting them and honoring them. This is kadib. It is kadib, it's lie, it's a lie. And what they do is kufr, it is disbelief. Then, Shaykh al Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, he brought the evidence for shafa'ah. He mentioned the evidence for qurba, then he mentioned the evidence for shafa'ah. He said, وَدَلِيلُ الشَّفَاعَةِ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى The evidence for shafa'a, meaning that the mushriks use shafa'a as an evidence, is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَيَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ وَيَقُولُونَ هَؤُلَاءِ شُفَعَاؤُنَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ They worship besides Allah that which does not harm them, nor benefit them. And they say these are our intercessors with Allah. So in other words, they already acknowledge. They acknowledge. They say that we they, they don't harm us, nor do they benefit us. They don't have any control over benefit or harm. But we worship them because we want them to be our intercessors. So once again, they have acknowledged that what they are doing is ibadah. Those mushriks in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they acknowledged. They said, مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ As occurs in the previous ayah. And here Allah says, وَيَعْبُدُونَ وَيَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Allah describes the action as ibadah. And so they acknowledge, they, don't, well, they acknowledge and say that we don't believe they benefit or they harm, but we want them to intercede on our behalf. Now, once they have this picture and this idea of Intercession in their mind That these people These dead people, these deities That they believe to be Intercessors This leads them to then make tawakkul To make tawakkul To rely upon the likes of these Deities So the hearts become attached To other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala They are interceders And we see That Their reliance now moves away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the owner of shafa'a and their reliance is now made upon these awliya, these dead people or these people in the graves to such a degree that if you read in the books of these people and you listen to their statements you will find some of them they will state that their sheikh or their wali is someone who will carry them on his back across the bridge over hellfire to guarantee them safety. As if he will pass over the hellfire like a bird, who will fly over the bridge like a bird onto the other side, and that he will carry these people who seek him for shafa'a, and who invoke him, and who rely upon him, and who turn to him and honor him, that he will carry him, carry these people over the bridge, over the sirat, over the hellfire. And this is what they say. These are some of the things that they say. So this is the level of tawakkul. They believe that these people will be their saviors. And they will carry them over the hellfire. And they will deliver them on Yawm Al-Qiyamah because they will intercede. 
So when this idea is in the mind of these people, as we see, as Allah has mentioned about the mushrikeen, وَيَقُولُونَ هَؤُلَاءِ شُفَعَاءُنَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Once they believe this belief, then following on that will be the tawakkul of the heart and the attachment of the heart. Just like the muwahideen, the people of Tawheed, what do they believe? They believe that all of shafa'a belongs to Allah. قُلْ لِلَّهِ الشَّفَاعَةُ جَمِيعًا As Allah says, Say to Allah belongs all of the shafa'a. So the muwahid, his heart is attached to Allah because Allah owns intercession and therefore their tawakkul is upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the mushrik, as we can see, they have this wrong belief, this erroneous belief. And so because of this erroneous belief, you find that it affects other aspects. The hearts become attached to these awliya. They depend upon other than Allah. And this now enters into the realm of shirk. This is now entered into the realm of shirk. Once that i'timad and tawakkul and that connection and attachment to the heart begins and sets in, this now is the essence of shirk, the essence of the major shirk. So anyone who depended upon other than Allah in the issue of shafa'ah, then he has committed shirk with Allah with the major shirk. After mentioning the evidences for each of these two, Qurba and Shafa'a, Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin al-Wahhab, he then went on to discuss, discuss the issue of Shafa'a, and he said, was Shafa'atu Shafa'atan, intercession is of two types, Shafa'atun manfiyah, wa Shafa'atun muthbata, that which is negated, and that which is affirmed, and as for the shafa'a which is negated, it is that which is requested from other than Allah in that in which no one has control over except Allah. So the Shaykh, Shaykh Muhammad Aman, rahimahullah ta'ala, he comments upon this and he says that those who seek intercession from other than Allah and think that they are interceders for them, that they will intercede with them, they do this without Returning to Allah, meaning that these people have no need to turn to Allah, uh, to return to Allah, rather they can intercede on their own, in their own right. They do not need to ask permission. Rather intercession is in their hands. And that's what they believe. They believe that these deities, these people they worship, have independent right of intercession. So for that reason you'll see that they say, O son so wali, or Sayyidi, or whatever else, intercede for me on the Day of Judgment. They will make, make out this dua, this call, this invocation. Because they believe the righteous, the pious, and likewise the prophets, they are able to intercede by their own right, and that this is a right that belongs to them. And so these people do not know that the shafa'ah, which is true and real, it belongs to Allah. It is a right of Allah. And this understanding of theirs, that they believe that the awliya or any of the angels or any of the righteous have the right of intercession, have an independent right, this is what is negated in the Qur'an. So everywhere that we see in the Qur'an where intercession is negated, it is this understanding of shafa'a, that anyone has the right or the ability to intercede, to commence to intercede with Allah of his own accord without any permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not how intercession works. And rather all of intercession belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so for that reason, Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Rahab, he brings the ayah as a proof for the negation of this type of intercession. This is in Surah Al-Baqarah. The ayah before ayatul kursi, verse 254. What the qawluhu ta'ala, the evidence is the saying of Allah the Most High, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, anfiqu mimma razaqanakum min qabli an ya'tiya yawm. O you who believe, spend from that which we have provided you with, before there comes a day. La bay'un fih. There's no trade therein. وَلَا خُلَّةٌ 
nor any intimate friendship wala shafa'a nor any intercession wal kafiruna hum adh-dhalimun and the disbelievers they are the oppressors or the wrongdoers the sheikh sheikh muhammad aman he says that uh, first of all about this ayah uh, he says that some of the people of kalam some of the people of ilmul kalam we mentioned them in the previous lesson the mu'tazila the khawarij they took this ayah and they misunderstood this ayah because they took this ayah in isolation of the remaining verses in the Quran so they said that intercession is completely denied in this ayah and so therefore that means that the sinful muslim the sinful believer there will be no intercession for him and he will remain in the hellfire forever this is said by the khawarij and the mu'tazila and this is from the innovations uh, because they took a part of the book and they rejected another part of the book but as for this ayah then what it is negating is the intercession which takes place without Allah's permission that intercession is denied and negated not that there will be no intercession whatsoever this is not the meaning of this ayah rather it is simply negating a type of intercession which is believed but which is false and which is not acceptable and which will not uh, you know which will not bear any fruits on the day of judgment so after mentioning this ayah as a proof for the shafa which is negated which we've explained it is that which is believed about the pious the righteous the angels the prophets that they can intercede on their own behalf after this Sheikh al-Islam goes on to mention the shafa'a which is muthbata which is affirmed and this is what he says hiya allati tutlab min Allah wa shafi' mukramun bi shafa'a that this is the one that is requested from Allah and the one who intercedes has been honored he's been honored by Allah by being given the permission to intercede So the Sheikh goes on to say Sheikh Muhammad Aman commenting upon this he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will honor that person when he gives permission to a person he honors that person in the sense <coughs> in the sense that when a person calls upon Allah making dua to Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to his dua he will respond to his dua and through this mechanism of dua allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he benefits the servants so the so the servants will benefit from the dua of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and likewise his intercession and in all of this everyone has a reward the one who intercedes will have a reward and the one who is interceded for by Allah accepting the intercession by Allah accepting the dua that person is blessed as well and honored in the sense that Allah has accepted the intercession for him so everyone for whom Allah is pleased and grants permission to intercede he has in fact been honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by being granted the permission to intercede Now all of this is from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is a bounty and the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what the essence of the point here that is being made is that shafa'a is ikram ikram it is something that Allah bestows upon a person with Allah giving him honor ennobling him by way of giving him the permission to intercede so in other words we are contrasting between what is believed by the mushrikun that the angels or the prophets or the righteous they have the automatic right to intercede they have this independent right to see this is their understanding of shafa'a but this is batil this is incorrect because the correct understanding of shafa'a is that it is ikram from allah allah chooses allah gives his permission to whomever he wills and he will honor certain people by giving them the permission and allowing them to intercede this is the correct understanding with us it is ikram it is allah making ikram of somebody honoring 
the Prophet Wasallam, or those from the righteous, from the believers, honoring them by giving them the, the permission to intercede. So this is a correct understanding of the issue of shifa'a, and this needs to be clear in our minds that when we address and speak to these people and they say that the awliya will intercede and the prophets will intercede and the angels will intercede and so on and so forth and you know, we are just simply asking for their intercession. He said, this is batil, because you are, are assuming that they have an independent right to intercede. And that Allah is obligated to respond to them and listen to them. And what you have done is that you have likened Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with those in the creation like the kings, because this is how it is with them. People can walk up to them, the ministers can walk up to them without their permission and start saying, and start you know, interceding for other people, for the subjects, maybe you should do this, maybe you should do that, maybe you should do this. And sometimes the king might feel obliged. So this is how it is in the creation. All of this is how we find it in the creation. To ascribe this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to liken him to his creation. And Allah has denied and negated this. Rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who honors whomever He wills. And He gives them the right and the permission. The permission and the right to intercede. So this is completely different to how it is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To Allah, it is a matter of ikram. He honors uh, people by allowing them to, to intercede. And then a second thing on top of that as well, once we understand the difference, a second thing as well is that the one who is interceded for, then he is one with whom Allah is pleased in terms of his speech and his action. وَالْمَشْفُوعُ لَهُ مَنْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَهُ وَعَمَلَهُ بَعْدَ الْإِذْنِ The one who is being interceded for, he is the one with whom Allah's speech and action he is pleased with after the permission has been granted. So permission has to be granted. This is ikram. Allah honors a person by granting him permission to intercede. This is the first thing. There is ikram. And secondly, that intercession will only be accepted and will only be made for the one with whose speech and action Allah is pleased with. And so therefore all of this indicates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only allows intercession for the muwahideen for the people of Tawheed. And so after this we see that many people, they are hasty, they fall in their desire to receive shifa'a, to receive intercession, they fall into things that prevent them from intercession. And we've seen from the evidence that the only people who will receive intercession are those who are the mukhlisun, the ones who are sincere, sincerely upon Tawheed, who say the kalima with sincerity, and whose actions are a proof that when they say the kalima, it is with sincerity. And the evidence for that is the hadith that we mentioned previously, the hadith of Abu Huraira, radiyallahu anhu, and he said to the Messenger of Allah Sallam, مَنْ عَسْعَدُ النَّاسْ بِشِفَاعَتِكَ, بشفاعتك يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Who is the happiest of people to receive your intercession on Yawm Al-Qiyamah? And this question, as we mentioned, is a great and mighty question. Even before answering this question, the Prophet ﷺ, he commented upon the question. And this shows the great virtue and excellence of Abu Huraira, رضي الله عنه. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, O oh Abu Huraira, I did not, uh, I, I, uh, I did not think that anyone would ask me the likes of this question before you. So meaning, the Prophet ﷺ, he knew and acknowledged the great zeal that Abu Huraira had for knowledge, and this is a praise, one of the great qualities of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu. So then he said, أَسْعَدُ النَّاسِ بِشِفَاعَةِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ مُخْلِصًا مِنْ قَلْبِهِ The happiest of people with my intercession on the Day of Judgment is the one who said لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ purely and sincerely from his heart. 
This hadith is reported by Al-Bukhari. And the meaning here is that out of sincerity, it means that his tongue does not oppose his heart, and his heart does not oppose his tongue. He says it out of all sincerity and purity. And this means, of course, that in his actions, his actions are a witness to the truthfulness of that which he says with his tongue, which is a witness to the truthfulness of that which he says with his heart. So therefore he invokes only Allah, he relies upon only Allah, he seeks intercession only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of this is connected. Now the shaykh says here that some people, they are hasty and they love to receive intercession but they fall into the things which will prevent them from intercession. All of this is because of their haste, and because of their zeal, and also because of their ignorance. And from the greatest of these barriers is shirk itself. He commits shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will leave soliciting intercession, which belongs only to Allah, and he will seek it from those to whom it does not belong. He will depend and rely upon the creation in matters in which they do not have any control. Even the best of all of creation, the most superior of all of creation with Allah, the most noblest of all of the servants, he is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Even he will not be allowed to intercede except after the permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know in that long lengthy hadith, the hadith of Shafa'a, the great shafa'ah that will take place, the first shafa'ah on the Day of Judgment, when the people will be raised and they will stand in, uh, you know, in, in a very calamitous situation. They are standing and waiting once they are raised on the Day of Judgment and they are bewildered and they want to go to anyone who will intercede with Allah to relieve them of this terrible standing where they are waiting. And to, and for Allah to pass the judgment, to either be in paradise or to be in hellfire, they want this judgment to be made because, because the, the, the terror of just waiting. And so they will begin naturally, they will begin with Adam, alayhi salam, then with Nuh, then with Ibrahim, alayhi salam, then with Musa, and Isa. They will go through every messenger from all of them, and each one of them will say, it is not for me. It is not for me, nafsi, nafsi, meaning that I am concerned with myself. And all of them will announce that Allah will become angry on that day with an anger that He has never become angry with previously, and nor with which He will become angry after it. And so this is also an affirmation of the attribute of anger in opposition to the uh, Jahmiya, the Mu'tazila, and the Ash'aris, and the Kullabi, and the Maturidiyya, that Allah will become angry, with an anger with which He has never become angry with before, and nor with which He will become angry after that. So then after all of these prophets are exhausted, meaning the people have gone to all of these prophets, they will come to the chief of the interceders, Muhammad, the messenger of Allah Wasallam, and he will say, it is for me, it is for me. So how will he intercede? He will intercede first of all by seeking permission. And what is the method of seeking permission? He will prostrate to Allah with a long prostration. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will leave him prostrating in the sujood for a long time. Allah will inspire him with uh, statements of praise and exaltation of Allah and venerating Allah and glorifying Allah. And he will remain in sujood until he is granted permission. So after a long, long period, a long, long time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to him, O Muhammad, raise your head, ask and you shall be given, and intercede and you will be given, you, 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 your intercession will be accepted. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam will say that Allah will apportion for me a portion. Meaning that there will be a group of people who will be allowed, who will be granted relief. And then he will go and intercede again. 
So meaning that a group of the people will be relieved of the terror of that day. And then another group of people, after another intercession, the person will intercede once more, and he will prostrate again. And after that intercession, another group will be granted relief from that terrible standing. And this will occur three times. It will happen three times. Each time, the messenger will go back and intercede again. What does this tell us? This tells us that intercession indeed belongs only to Allah. Because it could have been the case that on the very first intercession, everyone was granted relief from the terror and the calamity of standing and waiting and not knowing what's going to happen. But no, rather the Messenger of Allah each time only a certain group of people will be granted relief. Then he will go back again. And then he will prostrate again and make intercession. And then it will be accepted. And then another group will be granted relief. And then the third time, all of this indicates that it is indeed only Allah, no one else that controls all of intercession. And that it is not permissible to seek it from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this, when you, when you tell this to these people and you mention all of these texts and these evidences which are very clear and apparent, they respond with sentiments and emotions and as if they are the only people who love the Messenger of Allah. As if nobody else loves the Messenger of Allah Wasallam apart from them. These people who want to be hasty and want to receive the intercession as they claim, but they follow other than its path. And so all of this is a sign of the greatness of their ignorance. This is great ignorance. And the Shaykh says that had this ignorance been a simple type of ignorance, it could have been cured. But in reality we see that it is a compound type of ignorance. These people are ignorant, but they do not know that they are ignorant. And this is much more difficult uh, to treat. So in essence, to coming to a conclusion, the Shaykh says, how can we summarize this principle, the second principle? We can summarize it simply and concisely by saying that the worship of the mushrikeen, of their gods, was from this angle, was from the angle that they believed in the wasata, in this intermediary, and shafa'a, and seeking intercessions from this, this intermediary they put in between themselves. Not that these gods they were... That they, that they erected, not that these deities that they erected create and provide and sustain and control and so on and so forth. No, they were simply seeking intercession by making them as intermediaries and all of this is judged to be kufr and shirk. And inshallah ta'ala this brings us to the end of this lesson. We shall continue with an elaboration of this from the speech of Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi uh, in the next lesson. والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين